in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. We thank Allah over and over again for raising up in our midst a divine leader, teacher, and guide. The messenger of Allah, but more than a messenger, the Messiah that the world has long been looking for, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaykum uh, I would like to ask uh, your forgiveness for being late. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to hear the words uh, spoken by Brother Minister Sabir and uh, Minister Ishmael. I was looking forward to hearing and being inspired by others. I don't wish to keep you long. There's just a few simple points I want to make tonight. On Sunday, we took up with you the subject, uh, We Are the Overcomers. But in reality, we wanted us to see that gradually we are being overcome by the power of the wicked Caucasian scientists of evil. The Quran teaches us that the devil leads man to evil and indecency. And gradually, gradually, even the best are being overcome by the evil and indecency and filth projected daily, hourly, every minute of the day by our ever scientific enemies. They have learned the art of suggestion in such a way that makes the suggestion of Satan in the garden to Adam look immature. We mentioned on Sunday that there's something in the human spirit that rebels against orders. And the more you tell someone not to do something is the greater their desire to do the thing that you tell them not to do. In the Quran, Allah says that the devil caused Adam to slip by making a suggestion. It must have been a powerful suggestion to make Adam disobey direct orders from God. Just a suggestion. The Caucasian today is so wise in mind manipulation that most of us are being manipulated and think we are the manipulators. Most of us are very unaware of the artful way that the enemy is turning us from where we think we wanted to go to where he is now moving us. Thank you. 
in the Quran there's a, an Arabic word makara which is called in English a plan a plan is a well thought out stratagem to achieve certain goals and or objectives. Allah says in the Quran that they plan and he plans. Now we don't plan. Most black people have no plan. No plan for our lives. No plan for our families. No plan for our organizations. We just function from day to day without a plan. We move on a whim. We move on a fancy. We move on an inspiration, but not with a plan. But the Quran says they plan. When the enemy plans, He takes into consideration the forces that may be arrayed against the success of his plan and he plans against those forces. He organizes his forces to bring his plan to fruition. The Quran teaches us that the enemy's plan is so skillful that he literally turns a person with cunning and skill to an objective that is not the person's own objective. But with skill, he makes the person think that is his objective, but the objective is really the enemy's, but he turns the person so skillfully in that direction that the person does not even know he's being turned. God and the devil have a lot in common. We are on a planet that is turning and we don't even realize it is turning. That's how smooth it's moving. God turns us and the devil turns us. Both are turning us in a way that they want us to go. God sends us warning. Look at the way God operates. He sends warning, warners. And in the warning is not only an implied threat, but an actual threat. If you don't do such and such, this is going to be what will happen. And you know what the wicked say? Now bring on us what you threaten us with. Don't sell me no wolf ticket. Even if it's God talking, they say you can't threaten me. Satan comes different. There is no threat. He just drops a suggestion of a benefit if you go his way. He comes right in the nature of your own desires and will offer you what you want 
if you go my way. This is a formidable enemy. This enemy that has us in his grip is so powerful, brothers and sisters, that it takes God's coming himself to deal with this enemy. No prophet could deal with him. And if it were not for the help of God, every prophet would have been overcome by the wicked. God had to come and deliver his prophet at the last minute. Otherwise, the prophet certainly was overcome. To be overcome is to be defeated. To be overcome is to succumb to a power that is greater than your power to resist. And when a prophet of God is made to cry out and say, I am overcome, so do thou help me. He's saying that I, with all that I have on my own, I'm overcome. I don't have any power to do what you want me to do. You got to come now and help me. Otherwise, I'm defeated. And if I'm defeated, you are defeated. And God's own integrity is wrapped up in the cry of his servant and in his alleged defeat. So he waits until the last possible moment and then he snatches victory out of defeat. But those of us who are the servants of God, we have to know where the power is. You know, Jesus was a marvelous, marvelous teacher. It's too bad that those who represent him don't understand the majesty of his teaching. You know, Jesus, uh, the Christ, was not a prophet. He actually was the master of prophets. The prophets only represented a sign of him. But he was what they were pointing to. And if you listen to the language of Jesus, it is a perfect expression of complete humility and reliance on God. Listen to his words. I can of myself do nothing. That's very powerful. That's the same man that was opening the eyes of the blind, making the deaf hear, the dumb speak, and raising the dead to life, and doing miraculous things, but he had the humility to say that I can of myself do nothing. Whatsoever the Father commands me, that I do. Meaning, I'm waiting on the command of my father. I don't go ahead of my father. I go after he commands. I don't speak ahead of my father. Whatever he commands, that I speak. Whatever he commands, that I do. Brothers and sisters, Jesus in his wisdom, told the people when they saw him doing these miracles, wait a minute, wait, 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 don't worship me. Because the people are so lazy to worship the real God, they always want to stop somewhere. 
at some powerful individual who is also depending on a power bigger than himself. So Jesus was quick to tell the people, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such the Father seeketh. I'm not seeking no worshipers, Jesus is saying. Don't worship me. Worship who? The Father. Where did Jesus get his juice from? If you pardon that uh, cheap expression, I don't mean orange juice or anything like that. I mean, where did he get his power from? He got it from another power bigger than himself. And because he got that power from a power bigger than himself, he was quick to recognize that power, to submit to that power, to defer to that power. And he did not want the ignorant people worshiping him as the power because he knew that one day he would not be among them, but that power would always be among them. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? So Jesus told his disciples, pray in my name. And whatever you ask, not me, ask the Father in my name, he will grant it to you. He never said to you or me, pray to him. And this is where the church has gone off the path. We have made Jesus the fountainhead of power and left God out of the picture. This is wrong, my dear Christians. This is wrong. Jesus would not approve of the way you're preaching him. He would be displeased with us and he would, if he were present, correct our false representation of him. In the Quran, Allah asks Jesus in the day of judgment, Oh Jesus, did you Tell the people to take you and your mother for gods beside me? And Jesus answered saying, Lord, if I had done so, you certainly would have known it. For you know what is in my mind, but I know not what is in your mind. I only told them what you told me. Serve Allah, my Lord and your Lord. How did you get off the path? Because once a smart, crooked deceiver can take you away from the worship of God to the worship of a servant of God, he has short-circuited your power to resist the evil one. Mm. Man. No prophet of God was blind to where the power actually was. And when that prophet got in deep trouble and was about to be overcome, that prophet called on God to deliver him, and God always delivered his servants. So my subject to you tonight in the few moments that we will be together is taken from the Holy Quran where it reads, And Allah is the only reality. All things will pass away but the person of your Lord. What is a reality? 
That which is a reality is that which is real, that which is true, that which is a fact, that which is actual. Is this reality? Are you reality? Am I reality? Are we really? No, you're not. You're an illusion. And that's what I am. You go to a magic show. If you've ever gone to a magic show, they show you things that you see. A rabbit coming out of a hat, but the rabbit's not really coming out of the hat. If you see Siegfried and Roy, they make you see a lion, a tiger. And they got a tiger there, but they make it look like one thing when it's not. That's what an illusion is. It is an appearance that deceives by producing a false impression. Now you see it, now you don't. Illusion. Where's my mother? She was here just a few days ago. She's gone now like she never was. I can only remember her voice and her image, but I can never see her again. She's gone. Why? Because she was not real. Go ahead. Go ahead. She was a passing thing. The real thing was in her, but she was not the real thing. I'm going to talk to you tonight about what you worship other than Allah. God is trying to show you, beautiful sister, that your beauty is not real. It's an illusion that is passing away. So you're beautiful today, but time. Will wrinkle you like a prune. So you can only talk about what was when you were young. It's an illusion. So why worship that which is passing away and have no power to keep itself here? Why worship that? Why not find the real power and tie yourself to that which is eternal? God is the only reality. Everything else is passing away. Oh, here's the Pope. Which one are you talking about? <laughs> A man with flowing white robes, such majesty, such beauty. <laughs> and a puff of black smoke comes up out of the chimney of St. Peter's. We haven't made a decision on our choice of the next pope yet. The pope is dead, but long live the pope. The king is dead, but long live the king, huh? Because all of us are illusions. We're only here for a short time and we're gone. As much as I love Nat King Cole, as much as I love the voice of Sarah Vaughan, as much as I loved Sammy Davis Jr., as much as I admired Red Fox, as much as I admired those that have gone on that have really made my life uh, worth living because they added something, at least to my life. They're gone. I have the records of Sarah Vaughan I have the records of Nat Cole. I can put them on and hear them, but I can never go and see them. They are gone now. But Allah was, 
He is. He shall be. Everything is passing away. But the person of your Lord. So the Quran says he is the only reality. Not he's one of the realities. There is no other reality but God. Everything else is passing away. Sun, moon, and stars are passing away. Why bow down and worship that which is not real? It's dying, but God is the ever-living. Yes. It's losing its light, but he is the light. It's losing its power, but he is all-powerful. In every generation, in every age, God is God. Yes, but the fools in every age try to find something other than he to worship. Isn't that sad? People worship snakes. Snakes are passing away. Peace, people worship stone and water withers the stone. People worship fire. Dust can put out fire. People worship people and people come and go. People have found everything to worship trying to find the reality. Well, didn't you say that God came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad? Yes, I did say that. Why did you say that? That's what I was taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And that's what I believe. That power is manifest in a human being. But the flesh of that human being is an illusion. That's why you don't find pictures in any mosque or any image of God. Because if you make an image of what you think he looks like, you have to put him in flesh. And since flesh is finite, then the God, the flesh that dies, the spirit that lives and inhabits other flesh, then the picture that you got may change tomorrow. The image that you have may change tomorrow so you don't make no graven image to God. You don't put up no picture of him and say, this is him. Although we have a picture of Master Farad Muhammad, it should always be properly displayed. Yes, sir. Never in the mosque because we have never worshipped the flesh of nobody. Brother Ishmael Muhammad asked me the other day about the we in the Quran. It constantly says, and we did this and we did that. The wonderful originator of the heavens and the earth, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the one that originated this, he's not here now, he's gone. But yet he's here. But how is he here? He's not here in the, in the ma material form in which he was manifested. That's gone. But he's here. How do you know he's here? His mind is present. In the universe that he set up and the law that he set in motion, nobody has been able to build anything different from what he set up. They have to build according to his law, his principle, because his mind prevails. So he lives. Not in the flesh. He lives. His mind is constantly feeding new minds. The wise men that came up 
that became masters, they could only continue his work. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said he did not like darkness, so he said, there be a light. And he put a light out in space, and that light started vanishing darkness. Well, how long did it take to create billions of stars? And was one individual here to do all of that? Or was it many individuals working from the mind of that one? And so the Quran says, and we adorn the lower heavens with stars. We, who? Since God is one, why is there we there? Because we acted from the mind of that wonderful originator. Then there's a lower line of we. When it talks about Mary. And it reads in the Quran. And you were not present when they or we cast our pens to decide who would have charge of Mary. Who is that we? That's not the same we that set stars out. That's the we that made Holy Quran and Bible. That's a lesser we than the we that set stars in. And we raise mountains in the earth that lest it convulse and carry you away. That's another we. But only functioning from the principle of that originator. Where did you get your brains? Where did you get your body? Since you didn't design it. Well, if Master Farad Muhammad came in this body, then he has to pay honor, homage, and respect to the originator of the heavens and the earth because he, in his wisdom, is to perfect the wisdom of the originator. Yes, sir. But not by disrespecting him. And we cast truth at falsehood till we knock out its brain. That's another we. There's a group of people acting in harmony with the will of God. And that's what a Muslim is. A Muslim is one who submits to carry out the will of God. So you become a, 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 a conspirator, if you will with God to carry out his will that's good company to be in when you're in God's company working to carry out God's will he's the reality we pass away we are an illusion that is constantly passing away so should you worship an illusion? No, sir. If you do, you make a fool of yourself. <laughs> Look at your flesh. It gives us a lot of pleasure. It creates a lot of problems for us. <laughs> But there's another part of us that God gave us to master the flesh. But if we serve the flesh, we serve the illusion that is passing away. If we serve God, we serve the only reality that will keep us alive. And that's what eternal life is. It's not staying here forever. Is being wrapped up in him who is forever. Now, brothers and sisters, this kind of subject matter, you may ask Farrakhan, you know, why would you take up such a subject with us? What is the reason for that? <laughs> Uh, 
I'm taking up this subject with you because you don't have a lot of time to get acquainted with the reality. And if you don't know how to call on that reality, you have no help to keep you from being defeated in your desire for freedom, justice, equality, liberation, and salvation. Then this becomes a joke. This is not even worth our time. This becomes vanity. Our preaching becomes vain. It's worthless. It's like tinkling cymbals and sounding brass. It's valueless. If we just talk on the thing that is passing away and don't give people a chance to hold on to the only reality that there is. I don't know about you, but I know that I'm in a fight. If you are afflicted with any kind of disease that affects you internally, your body has to fight to overcome it. Is that right? When you're in a fight, everybody wants help when you're fighting. When you throw down, if you pardon that expression, and somebody is kind of putting it on you, you look around and see where the buddies are. <laughs> Do I have any help? It's something when you are in a fight and you're alone and you got to summon everything within you to keep from being overcome by that which is trying to impose its will on you. A woman involved in rape how do you respond to rape? How do you handle it? Do you just submit and tell him, no, 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 don't, don't, no, no, don't, don't, no, no. That's your life. If you fight, <clears throat> and you're fighting for a right principle, you may die. I'm not going to say that every time you fight for a righteous principle, you're going to live. Because there's too many dead people that have fought for a righteous principle, but death again is an illusion. You know, when you die in the way of God, there is no death for you. It means the flesh go back to the earth all right enough. And that's the only thing, that's the only reality we know right now is the flesh. But there is another reality beyond this. I've had out of the body experiences. I don't know about nobody else. Well, I have literally seen places that I've never been before. And then went there and saw it exactly as I saw it in my experience. So I know that real sight is not with the eyes. 
And I know that real hearing is not with the ears. Real sight has always been with the mind. And if we are rightly tuned, we can get up out of the flesh which limits the spirit. And literally travel and see worlds without ever going there. This mind is fantastic. The flesh limits. So to worship the flesh is to limit you. We like different kinds of people. I like the way this one looks or that one sings or this one does that or this one does the other. And we all just fasten ourselves to different people. Every little group got their little leader, you know, as your main man that you follow. And you ask yourself, what are you following? Do you know that whatever you worship, you receive the impress of that on your nature and character? You worship that which is not good, then evil is impressed upon you. If you worship Allah and Allah alone, then the righteous character of Allah becomes your character. Muslims, we are in the fight of our life. Any righteous person in this audience who believes in God, who is trying to rear your children in a world that is decadent and on its way out, you are in the fight of your life to maintain your integrity and your sanity in this world. And you can't do it on your own. You need help. And so, my beloved brothers and sisters, when the prophets were overcome, they cried out for help. And help came. Didn't come when they wanted it, but it did come on time. And every prophet was delivered. As I look at my own people, And I am supposed to be a representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. A man who came to reform our lives. He didn't come to talk smart. He did not come to tickle our ears. He came to make a difference in our lives from evil to what? To righteousness. Everything that I know of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was that he wanted to make a wrong people right. And he taught us that our power is sustained by our being right. He wanted the sisters to dress how? Right. Yeah. Who determines what is right for you? God. And if God says, sisters, be modest and cover yourself, why fight that? Satan's got all kind of style. And they are appealing. I mean, to what? What do they appeal to in you? No, I just want to know, you know, what, what is it that is so appealing? Why do they look so nice? Why, why are they so attractive? I mean, what is it about it? You see, if you think you're fine,
which is an illusion. Let's <laughs> go. You want to display your what? Finery. Come on. So the, the designers shape and mold the clothing to display your finery. So the Quran says, display not your finery as you did in the days of your ignorance. I didn't say it. God said it. So you have a beautiful waistline and a beautiful hip line and a well-formed bus line. Display your finery. So Satan now got dresses, suits, their arms are covered. <laughs> but there's a big gash in the front. <laughs> where your breast is just out. Right. I'm embarrassed places I go. I went to a place recently, there was a, 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 um, a benefit for a young baby that is to be born that needed a heart transplant. Yes, sir. And I went to show support and Stevie Wonder was performing and there was a woman the whole back was out. No back at all. I mean, can you imagine? This is not a beach. <laughs> this is a theater. And if she had no back, she had no foundation to hold her. So her front was exposed. And this woman was walking and bending over and doing... I'm embarrassed for the woman because the woman is crazy. <laughs> she doesn't have a level of civilization and shyness and shame that she wants to show herself in that manner. That's the way of the world. Jesus would not be pleased with that. And if Jesus told you he wasn't pleased, you tell Jesus, I ain't coming to church no more. Uh, Jesus, you all right, just stay out of my clothing closet. Mind your business, go on and make the blind see, but just leave my dress alone. <laughs> Brothers, they, they, they're styling clothes for us today. The same old freaks. <laughs> and I'm messing her up. They got us wearing clothes that excite women. <laughs> I got a witness. <laughs> Years ago, the freaks left us alone. They just concentrated on her. Today the world has gone so mad, there's so many men looking at men till they have to expose men's backsides so that men can see what other men have and women can see what other men have. So we just get crazy. This is a sick, 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 sick world. And what's so sad, a lot of us are getting sick with it and don't know that we are gradually being taken down it's so subtle that we are going down 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 and we don't realize that we are falling 
And as I looked in December last year in Los Angeles at nearly 50,000 people in the Coliseum, a beautiful group of black people, and on one side were the Bloods and the other side the Crips, and right after the lecture was over, just a block or so away from the Coliseum, a man was shot to death while he was in his car. I said in my heart, I really don't wish to deal with this anymore. Because you are not getting any better with preaching. I believe that God has made me one of the finer teachers in the world today. But teaching is not going to help you. I have come to that conclusion. I see that we have been or are almost overcome by the same devil that we dislike. He's now in the house among the believers crippling us in our relationships with each other and we are steadily going down and down into the pit of evil filth and indecency. We as Muslims and we as Christians, if you just look at what we're involved in and look at what's going on in religious houses, it's enough to turn the stomach. So Satan is laughing. I remember one day I came to the messenger and I had on a suit. It was one of these bell-bottom suits. That was a long time ago. And it had a dip in the hip, you know, in the waist. And it had a little flare. Little pleat in the back. I had one of these fly handkerchiefs falling out. I had a beautiful tie. The knot was laid and... And I walked into the home of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he looked at me. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, I salam alaikum, brother. <laughs> and I was so happy to see him as I always am and was. Wa alaikum salam, dear apostle. How are you, sir? And he said, fine, brother. He said, uh, brother, the devil was outside looking at you. <laughs> he would say that uh, Muhammad uh, got his body, <laughs> but I got his mind. I was shocked. He said, look at the way you come here, brother. Where did you get such crazy style as a minister? representing such high wisdom, dressing in such foolery. He said, brother, take off that silly looking tie <laughs> and I want you to put on the bow tie like you see me go. I want you to get one of these bow ties, brother. He said, these Jews in uh, New York City, they make mohair I want you to go and get the finest silk mohair and get you some suits made, three-piece suits, brother. And I want you to be a dignified preacher of Islam. And the next time I see you, don't you ever let me see you in such style as this. I said, yes, sir, dear apostle. 
I took that fool suit off. <laughs> this is the truth. I went downtown just like he told me. Got the finest silk mohair that they make. And I had me a tailor make me three, four, five suits. And I was anxious to get back out to Chicago to let the Honorable Elijah Muhammad see his obedient servant. And I have worn a straight tie every now and then, but from that time to this, I have worn the bow tie. And I don't wear necessarily all silk mohair suits, but the point I'm making is, he said, I got your body, but Satan got your mind. And whoever got your mind don't care where your body is. And the way you dress and style yourself is an indication of your thinking. And it don't make any difference what church or mosque you go to. That's But who got your mind? And what I'm suggesting to all of us is we are just about overcome by Satan. 24 hours a day, he's bombarding us. You leave here right now, go right in your car, and turn on your radio. That's the end of this lecture. When you get in that car tonight, don't turn on no radio. Don't turn on no CD. I don't want to hear no damn television. I want you to leave here quiet and think. And on your way home, just if you ain't got nothing to say about this, just shut up and think about you and where you're going. Yes, sir. You are all but overcome. White folk got black people in his hip pocket and he's on his way to hell and he's taking us down. So I close by saying when the dry bones in the valley heard the word, the word fascinated them and the bones just shook and rattled and it looked like the bones were going to come together. But after a while, the son of man who was in the valley looked at them and said, My God, the bones are rattling, the bones are shaking, but there's no life in them. There is no real spiritual life in the bones. So he went back to the son of man and said, or to the Lord and said, Lord, I have spoken to them, but they have not heard. There's no life in them. In words, what shall I do? And do you know what? The Lord never sent that man back to speak to the bones anymore. He said, go back and prophesy to the winds. And let the winds blow on the bones. And it was only then that the bones stood up. Brothers and sisters, do you have any idea of what that means? For you, for you, for me, for us in the future? For 60 years now, Warning has been going on to you. And there is no doubt that you love the word because everywhere we've gone with the word, you respond. You just love the word. That's right. But there's no life in you. You know how we know that you're not alive? That the word is not alive in you? The scripture says it like this. We can tell that we have passed from death into life because we love 
the brotherhood. We say we're alive, but we don't love each other. We're so quick to jump on each other. We're so quick to threaten each other. We're so quick to say what I do to one another. Why? Because the spirit of life, it ain't there. It is not there. The wisdom is there, but life ain't there. Damn, you got the knowledge, but you're dead. You're thugs with knowledge. Thugs and gangsters with knowledge. You're worse now than you ever were because you have knowledge and you're no good with knowledge. Rotten with knowledge. So you become like slimy, slippery demons. Teaching you don't make sense. And I'll be frank with you, I'm tired of it. Because I don't really see the results in us that make it worthwhile to keep teaching. So I think it's time for the winds to blow. And they are blowing, brother. I feel sorry for us because very, very, very hard times are right at the door. If you pick up this Quran and learn to read it, man is in loss today. And we are losing because our faith, our belief, our worship is vain. We worship Allah conditionally. You do this for me, I do that for you. We take our law like a summer or winter coat. We put it on when it's cold, we take it off when it's warm. We're not really true worshipers of God. We've become worshipers of illusions. And we're deceived by our own false impressions of ourselves. Lord, have mercy. I mean, I, I'm so sad when I think about us and conversations that I have with people who are sick and don't know they're sick. My God. We want to be great so bad that we don't know that greatness is only in God. And we don't want to go the right way to manifest greatness by surrendering completely to him that his greatness may shine through us because it's not ours. We want to be great without him. <clears throat> cool out, God. I, I don't need you for this. We worshiping illusions. That's my man. Reverend so and so, brother so and so, leader so and so. No, brother. All of them passing away. Garvey came, Garvey gone. Malcolm came, Malcolm gone. Martin came, Martin gone. Dubois came, Dubois gone. Abraham came, Abraham gone. Noah came, Noah gone. Moses came, Moses gone. Jesus came, Jesus gone. God lives. God lives. So you who want to worship men, go right ahead. But if you want to worship Allah, you're on the right road. I noticed you didn't say the Honorable Elijah Muhammad came and Honorable Elijah Muhammad went. 
He did come and he did go, but yet he is. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Moses came and Moses went, but yet Moses is. Yes. Jesus came and Jesus went, but Jesus is. Because those men never gave themselves to vanity. They gave themselves to the only reality and in that reality they live. Yes. There's no death for Abraham, Moses, Noah, Lot, Jesus, Jonah, Muhammad. They never die. They live in the reality that they served. And that's why the Quran says on all of them, generations after they're gone, generations will come and say, peace be unto Moses and his family. Peace be unto Jesus. Peace be unto Muhammad. What will they say about us? I am concerned that we get our act together quick. I am concerned, brothers, that we don't get caught up in foolish, vain hero worship and not wise worship of the only reality. Today's hero is tomorrow's broken idol. God never lets us down. Why not worship that in which there is no imperfection? I'm imperfect. I try to be good. I try to be just. I try to be fair. But I'm not always right on the mark. That's real. That's real. So why worship me? You know what I mean? You don't want to worship imperfection, then you become imperfect. You want to worship perfection so that you can be perfected by perfection. Yes, if you start worshiping imperfection, then you make excuses for imperfection to justify your own madness. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Does it hurt your feelings that I speak honestly about myself? No, sir. I'm not a bad man. I think I'm a very good man. Yes, sir. But I, you know, that's my opinion. God knows the truth. You understand? Yes, sir. Although I'm not boasting, I'm not boasting. The truth is, I'm only saying what he said of me. He said, I'm the best that he had. You didn't hear him, did you? <laughs> Don't bear witness to nothing that you didn't hear. You either believe me or you disbelieve me, but you can't bear witness and say, that's what he said, because you don't know. <laughs> On that tape that you heard him say, obey me, he did say that. And he did say that wherever I tell you to go, you go. And wherever I tell you to stay from, you stay from. He did say that. But the things that he told me about myself, and, I, and, I, and I'm not boasting at all, because I've really learned through my short stay on this earth how much of nothing I am and how great he is, God is. And I wouldn't lead you in a way to worship me, man, if you gave me a billion dollars. Because I cannot handle you in the day of judgment. When Allah asked me, did you tell them to worship you? And he's a witness. I tried to throw you off of me. You know, and tell you where it is. I tried to point it out to you where it is. 
And you know why I do that, brothers? Everybody wants to be loved. Nothing wrong with that. But to be worshipped, you ought to leave that alone. When you get too much adulation and admiration of the people, you're in dangerous water. And you better learn quick how to throw it off. Otherwise, it'll make you drunk. And you'll find yourself, um, you know, kind of um, having an accident on yourself. And, and no, nobody, you won't know it, but everybody else will see you kind of messing up. Worship Allah. There is no God but He. He is the living who never dies. He is the perfect one. He is the power behind all things. Why deny Him when you were without life and He gave you life why deny him when all of the favor that we have, we got it from Allah. Let us worship Allah. Before it's over, you will learn how to call on him. And before this is over, you will not associate any rival, any partner with him. Before this is over, you will know that he is your greatest friend. And before this is over, you might learn that he's your only friend. He and the messenger and the true believers. I come to you tonight in this solemn spirit. Because I hope sincerely that you will learn the greatness of Allah. When I'm in trouble, as I am in trouble, I don't know no one to call on but Allah. I don't call on nobody here to help me. And they'll tell you, I have never called them in the middle of the night. I got a problem. Come talk it over. Let me talk it, talk it over with me. Well, they can't help me with my problem. Best they can do is sit and listen to me, but they can't help me with it. I know where my help is coming from. And you better know where yours is coming from and get there quick. Call on him. He loves you and me so much. He's so anxious to prove his power with us. And it really offends him that we don't make better use of him. Well, he ain't got to worry about me. Because I'm in so much trouble. That he may get tired of me calling on him. Because I call from morning till night. Because I know that this enemy wants me out of the way. And will stop at nothing to destroy me. And if you could see the plan that this beast has. For me and for us. It would overwhelm us. The Quran says. Surely. The devil. Had planned. To ruin thee. Yeah. And were it not for Allah's grace. He would have. And Allah's grace on thee is mighty. That enemy is planning. For you. For me. For you. For us. And the only way we can escape his plan. We must fly to Allah and seek refuge in him yes. and you know what 
the Quran says, and win Allah's help and victory comes. You can't be defeated with his help. That's what you got to understand. There is nothing that you desire in this life of good that you will be defeated in with the help of God. As long as God's help is there, you can't be defeated. Do you hear? Yes, I know that as long as I'm with him and he is with me, I can't be defeated. And you can't cannot be defeated as long as you are with God and God is with you. When Allah's help and victory comes, because when his help comes, victory comes right behind it. When you overcome, you prevail over your opposition. You prevail over temptation. You overpower or overwhelm in body or mind. Whatever is in front of you, you overwhelm it instead of it overwhelming you. But you'll never do it until his help comes. Yes. His help brings you victory. I want to be a winner. Don't you? Yes, sir. Do you really? Yes, sir. Is there a habit that you have that you're fighting to overcome? Let's look at that as we leave you. Each of us got something that we're battling, right? Sometimes you get the better of it, don't you? And then sometimes just when you think you got it licked, Come on. It slips right back up and snatches you. And then you say, oh, man. It, sometimes you get so hurt to see yourself slipping back into old bad habits that you just decide to quit fighting. If you stop fighting, you become a hypocrite. Because you know you're doing the wrong thing in the right place, trying to be with the right people, dabbling in the wrong thing. You need help, don't you? Yes, sir. Well, if you need help, where's your help coming from? See? See, Noah said, oh, I'm overcome. Do thou help me. When you feel like you're overcome, I'm telling you, quick. Call on him. Call on him by his name. His name is not God. His proper name is Allah. That's right. And that's the name the white man never wanted you to know. The true name of the true God. Just try it tomorrow morning. I mean, not that Jehovah is not a good name. That is a great name. We're not saying that any of these great names are not good names. He knows all his names. He answers you. But he says, call on me by my name and I will answer you. If I'm Lewis and you call John, I ain't answering. So call on Allah. That name, I mean, remember that name. And call on the name of Allah when you need help. And that's when. So call on Allah. That name, I mean, remember that name. And call on the name of Allah when you need help. And that's when. Some of you say, well, I called on him and he didn't answer. Maybe you weren't open for the answer when it came. Because you're looking for the answer to come from a certain place and it comes from another place. 
when you ask Allah for help, stay open. Because the help may come to you in a way that you least expected it from a source that you least expected. Yes. Yes. If you're open, you'll hear your answer. Yes. That's just what I was looking for. That's right. It's not a problem that you got that you haven't got help to overcome. That's right. Will we be the overcomers? Yes, yes sir. Or will we be overcome? If you fasten on the only reality, you have already overcome. 90% of our weakness is due to polytheism. Setting up partners and rivals with God. Worshipping things that are unworthy of being worshipped. Bowing down to things that are unworthy to be bowed down to. So I thank you for allowing me... Uh, these few minutes of your time. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Wa alaikum salam. Yes, sir. There are sisters who don't fight when they are being raped. And there are sisters who will beg for their life. They won't get the fight. Some analysts or whatever I've seen on shows say, you feel better to fight. Even if you don't win the fight, you are wrecked. Quick to you, yes sir, brother. Your sisters that won't fight. Well, my sister, when you know Allah, you will fight. Sometimes you become so frightened. Yes, sir. You can't fight. You're in such shock. You're traumatized and you don't fight. There was a sister <clears throat> in uh, Phoenix and um, a man broke into her home and uh, as I recall the incident when she awakened this man was in her room in her bed getting ready to rape her she was struggling but she had the presence of mind to call on Allah and when she called on Allah and began fighting this black man knew that she was a Muslim. Then when she said Allah, he became frightened. And he jumped up off of her and began to run. And of course, when we found out about it, the FOI was hunting him down to kill him. And... <clears throat> Death to all rapists. Women are sacred. And the violation of women is the violation of every human being. Raping a woman is not a violent act just against a woman. It's a violent act against humanity. Because she's the mother of human beings beings we've got to think like that and I tell you my dear sister who has if you've ever suffered this gross indignity Allah has come to heal our wounds and even though rape is such a terrible crime that leaves its victim scarred almost for life Nevertheless, God is able to restore you totally and completely. And to my sisters, I, I tell you, please be careful. Where you go, 
how you go in a world like this. Don't ever think that you can't be raped because there's madness out there. And if you present yourselves properly, try not to be alone. Late at night, walking. Try not to be like I see some of these women put on these body suits and start jogging around. There's madness out here. And the way the world and the enemy has suggested so much sex into the minds of the people, they will rape you. But it is our duty, brothers, to kill the rapists. Yes, sir. You know, it's our duty. You all shouldn't hang out in the streets late at night. If you're not going any place, be at home. If you're going someplace, go. But late at night, you should always be escorted by your husband, your brother, your father, but young women or older women out on the street alone at night, you're inviting disaster. And we, the brothers, are sworn to defend and protect you with our lives. And we will do that. We just want you to be as decent as you can. Look as right as you should. Be as right as you can. So that the brothers, when they go to give their lives for you, it will be justified. May Allah bless you. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you. arguing with Allah <laughs> when you hear Allah speak you recognize it and he spoke to me right through the system don't get discouraged brother you just keep going but I do know this that my time is limited there's no person that gives a message that there's not a limit on the time and when you hear a person with a message talking like this, though you're perfectly correct in what you say, I'll have to do that until he takes me away. I'm trying to let you know that uh, the Quran also says he would not chastise the people while you were among them. But when he takes his servant out from the midst of the people, then it's over. Allah is very angry, brothers, I tell you. He's very, very angry. And I mean, you can see Bush and white folk getting set to be destroyed. I mean, they're riding higher now than they've ever ridden. Russia gone, and, and he's feeling his Cheerios, and my sister's from Nigeria. This man is raising havoc in Africa. I'm talking about Bush. A U.S. administration. But Allah is about to clip his wings. 
So you're right, sister, and you're right, all of you, you're right. I can't do nothing but do what I'm doing until Allah says stop. But I think he's getting close to saying it. I'm not just saying that to be saying it. There are signs in the world and there are signs in you that let me know it's getting close. So I'll do just that, sister. I'll keep on doing it until he says stop. And I'll try to do it to the best of my ability. And I want to encourage the ministers and those who teach. Please, uh, brothers that teach, don't teach for applause. Don't teach to try and make the people roused up emotionally. That will come if you're really emotionally involved in your subject matter. That will happen. happen. But teach to raise the people. That when you leave them, they're one notch higher than when you found them. And if you do that, God will be pleased with your preaching. But if you get them emotionally aroused and you have not raised them, in levels of consciousness and wisdom, then you and I have failed in our representation of truth. Thank you for your statement, sister. I saw brother's hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Yes, I something I want to get to say. I just couldn't hold it back. I'm from the 12th Michigan. I'm working here in Chicago. And I'm around. And I'm coming through the city. My brother here is very mad at me. We had three hours to spare. We got here real late, but I spent this incident coming down State Street. I was playing to my father. I observed it was a young female, three girls, like five years even had a young lady with long butcher knives up to her throat. Say that again? They had butcher knives up to a young lady's throat over there on State Street. And uh, I don't know the cross street, it's one of those streets. And I come through there at five o'clock, so when I'm driving a van, and I slammed my brakes and made a U turn. And when I approached the sisters, uh, I got out of my van and stood there because I was so confused who was who was loud. It was about a gang. She's with one gang, and they wanted to kill her because she was seen with a gang member who they've been looking for. So I explained to the sisters, why don't y'all put the knives down and leave the young lady alone? And these were some very tough young ladies. They used to put the knife around and told me, hey, I'm going to check you again. You better step back. They were the more than 16, 17. They had butcher knife this long, so... I stood back and I was a little scared. I didn't know what to do. I was confused. So I went to the, think the beauty shop, some kind of hair salon, and told the sister, would she better, could I push her into her place? And she said, no, I'm not going to lie over here. So what I done then was I didn't know what to do. So another brother was with them, had a pistol, and I didn't know the brother was with them. He was the one telling them to kill the sister. I backed up to tell the brother, uh, can you help me? He rolled his ass and went in his coat and bad down, like, you better get going. So what happened were, I didn't see a police again. And I was so confused back then now. So when I went and told the young lady, I said, I will give you $20 for this knife right now. One of the young girls said, okay. And she said, I'm gonna warn you last time, get back. And she was giving the guy the word to go ahead and shoot me. When he went back to pull the gun out, I didn't know what to do. So when I stood back and mentioned him, I mentioned your name to him how they should be together and love one another. When I mentioned your name, he kind of like put the gun back, confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was still debating on shooting me. He was like confused, or should I do it that way? He walked around. And I pulled the money out, then I thought, I said, he's gonna shoot me anyway to take my money out. Like, you know, so I was a little friends, brother, so just when I banned up, they started to cut the sister. One of them cut her, and the each one three of the night, they was tearing the clothes off, and they hit me with the knife, and started to cut her. I couldn't do no more watch, because his brother was gonna shoot me, so I jumped in my van and ran the corner, hollering, trying to get the police. And nobody went paying any attention. I asked a couple of brothers, why don't y'all help me? We just gonna. Nobody wanna get involved. And I wanted, I knew this guy finna shoot me. Now he was spinning up anyway. It was like the last one, I'm telling you to go. And I mentioned your name, I kept trying to teach them how y'all should be loved one another. Let's be fighting on it. Let's go on. And uh, by that time, 10 police came there. And the police officer told me, 
He said, I said, sir, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I was explaining to him how I deserve it. He said, you lucky. He said, I know that guy. If that guy didn't kill you, I don't know what saved your life. They know him for being a tough guy and doing a lot of shooting over him. And, uh, and I guess if we'll mention your name, I guess that will save my life as well. <laughs> Thank Allah that he spared your life. That's what I was talking about earlier, brothers and sisters. Our people have gotten so savage that teaching alone is not going to help us. And now I'm going to tell you, brother, um, the worst of our people can be brought back from that state and made into some of the finest individuals that you could find. But it is our failure to get to them with the word properly that allows this condition to prevail. And that's what I meant when I said we are all but overcome. I'm not saying these words just because it's a subject that I'm just taking up. This brother bore witness to exactly what I said. That teaching is not going to help our people. But the alternative is so horrible. Let me tell you what's about to happen, you know. Our people have gotten into a mode of killing. Human life don't mean anything anymore. That little girl's life didn't mean nothing to those girls. And that boy who was there with the pistol, urging them to kill that child, he don't see that that's his family. That's his own flesh, his own blood he's killing for nothing. You couldn't reason with them in the state that they were in. Their desire to kill that child was stronger than anything you could say. And you're saying my name may have meant something momentarily. But even that name and what it represented, he thought on it for a minute, but then the desire to kill even overpowered what the name represented, showing you that the stopping of him, he knew that that name represents something good for us as a people. So I, 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 I'll stop for a minute, but I'm telling you, get on out of here. I, I'm going to kill you for sure. Yeah. Well, brother, something is going to happen. And I guarantee you, you won't want to kill too much. You see, this white man is a made killer. I want you to listen to me well. I'm not going to talk long. But God is going to turn him loose on you. Since you like to kill, then I'm going to introduce you to a real killer who has made his power on this earth through killing human beings wholesale. And since you won't respect Allah and respect the life that Allah gave to you and to all of his creatures, then God will send a killer against a killer. 
This is the history of the world. You know, whenever a righteous group lost their righteousness, God brought killers. Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan and them boys, they came out of the east on Damascus and Syria and all those so-called Muslim lands. Slaughtering them, brother. You, my dear brothers, don't see that this white man is getting angrier and angrier by the moment at us. He's preparing to slaughter. And we are giving him the excuse. So if you won't listen to a right word, then you'll have to feel the wrath of God. But it won't come down, say, from God himself. It'll come through agents of death that he will send among you. And I'm telling you, it's not going to be a good thing to see. That experience that you have, that you have had, 20 years ago, that you probably wouldn't see something like that. Not with young girls. Shows you that we're going steadily, steadily, steadily down. And white folks can sit back and say, we, we, we've got them exactly where we want them now. I'm glad that uh, Allah blessed you to make it. I hope the little girl made it. See, but the police, just look at their talk. They're not trying to stop them from killing one another. They're telling you, don't come back. They will kill you. You know, they were rounding the, the, the youngsters up. Don't come back down this way, but he's, boy, I'm telling you, if we, the FOI, don't grow fast yes, sir. and strong yes, sir. to help bring some sanity to our community, nobody love our people, brother. Many of the police don't care nothing about our killing one another. They encourage it. Oh, I saw one hand. Yes, sir, Brother Eddie. Wa alaikum salam, sir. So, you know, if the teaching doesn't do us any good, and our people then, then should we stop, you know what? When you stop, do if some of us are trying to do some things, stop them. If, if you not already gave a clue, then it takes up else. And, you know, what's the point of us even doing what we You're doing what you're doing to save as many as you can. You know, there are a few people that will hear the word and respond to it. You did. And there's more like you. There's more like these. But we're gradually being overcome. That's what I'm telling you. And if the help of God doesn't come, this is over. And I know his help is on the way. That's what I'm saying. When I stop you, you have to stop. <laughs> The book says, work the work of him that sent you while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. So when the night comes, you ain't going to be able to say nothing to nobody. But do all you can now. Don't sit down and say, well, I ain't doing nothing. 
because you will be charged for not doing what you are supposed to do. I don't think God will, will charge me because I'm doing my job. I'm teaching our people every day. All over the world. So I can't be charged with negligence of my duty. I'm doing that. And you do it. Because if, if they hear or forbear, your job is to give them the word. Um, and based upon how you give them the word is their judgment as well as yours and mine. A messenger is only responsible for the clear delivery of a message. But if the messenger don't deliver the message, then the messenger will be judged by God. Do you understand? Yes, so each of us are little messengers with a message. We have to bring the Quran to the people. Whether they accept it or reject it, that's not your job. Your job is to clearly deliver the message of the Quran. Is that right? then do your job. I do mine, you do yours, we do ours, and then let the people either accept or reject. You can't make anybody a believer, nor can I. I saw one hand back here. Yes, brother. Way in the back, and I'll come to you, sir. Yes, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Drug free, those six feet tall now is my son, Ishmael X. Kareem. How are you doing? You said about how things are here and you're gone and Allah lives on. My son and I live in a different house, but Allah serves both our houses and serves him. And I, I bear witness that there is nobody in the best nor is Allah. My yes, brother, sir. In a way, like Abraham, if you just give your son and your children to Allah, you ain't got no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my patient brother. Thank you. My question is, you have a program that wants to keep drugs out of the community, around about the nation of Islam. I would like to know why come we don't have any games like this in Chicago. I would be having a little bit. If we had drugs in our community, I would like to know how come we don't have anything like that. Yes, sir, we're working on it here now. Brother, what we did in, in uh, Washington was a pilot project. And what we found was as long as the brothers were in that community, drugs went down, crime went down. But all it did was move the drug people from one neighborhood to another. We never eradicated drugs. We only cleaned up that small area. And I don't know exactly how many men it took and it takes now to keep that area patrolled and clean. But that experiment proved that the presence of the believers, the brothers, was in itself um, a, um, a bulwark against crime, against drugs. We are preparing now to deal with um, the projects. We're just going to take a particular project and try. We found in Washington that when we went to clean up the drugs, that our worst enemies were the police. Not the drug people. When the drug people saw us coming, where's Captain William? Come in, brother, brother Captain. Uh, this is the brother that uh, started the program in Washington. Brother Captain William started the program in Washington, D.C. under our guidance. 
And he followed our instructions to the letter and God blessed him with success. He had a strong group of dedicated men who put Allah first. And because they were disciplined and feared only Allah, they were able to face the guns of the drug dealers unarmed and then face the drawn guns of the police. And what brother found was that at the top, not at the very, very top, but near the top of that uh, command in that section, they were, getting, they were getting heavy, heavy payoffs. And when the brothers moved in, it cut what they were getting. So instead of the drug dealers retaliating, it was the police that came against the brothers. And luckily, the brothers stood their ground and then took it to the highest police authorities. And those commanders, I, don't, I think they were moved out of that district. Is that right? And then there was some better police-Muslim cooperation and the, 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 the area was stabilized. But even with that, they kept trying to move the drugs in and move against the brothers. People like to use the Muslims. They want the Muslims to protect their community. They want the Muslims to protect their schools. They want the Muslims to be their security patrol while they carry on their own affairs and deny the God and the religion that makes these men what these men are. We're not that for you. We're not your drug busters. We are your brothers. And if we bust drugs, we can show you how to bust them. And since you live there, bust the drugs in your own community. Mm -hmm. Wait, 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 wait. See, but, you know, we, not get, we don't get paid for this. The police get paid. The Muslims' lives are on the line because they love our people. But I don't like our people's response half the time. Our people respond to the brothers like we are some goon outfit that is just there for protecting events. I don't like that. I don't like us to be used, to be frank, I'm just saying this publicly, as protectors for the madness of our people. No, sir. If you want the good of Islam, then submit and become that yourself. You understand? Don't use our submission for your protection in your rebellion. You are as much Muslim as we are. If you give yourself a chance to be that, the same strength that is in these brothers is in every one of you if you submit to Allah as we have done and try to follow the Quran and the teachings of Islam and the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as we have done. Then you will be strong wherever you are. You will be a light. But to expect a handful of brothers to police a city, that's not wise. But what we're going to do is try to do that for a particular project. We won't name it just yet. We're working on it now. And we will try to clean up just one place at a time. And in the project houses, you know, you have 90% of the homes run by females. Hardly any men there that live that are stable there. And when we go, we try to produce the strength of a family and then raise men up to protect their own community. Yes, but we can't be there forever. We have to raise the men that are there, train the men that are there, and leave them there to protect their own community. And we just do it block by block, and little by little, till we get the whole community back under control. 
But I think we got to do our job. And that is part of our job to train our people to become defenders and protectors of their own women and children and their own community. And I say to all the young brothers who are parts of uh, members of various uh, gangs, as they're called, there's nothing wrong with being a member of a gang if the group that you belong to is doing something positive. But to just be a member of a gang to say that you don't like the way this one, what colors they wear or the way they cock their hat, and then you're going to kill your brother over something stupid like that. Brother, then you become an enemy of your people and you become the agent of the white man to destroy your own community. So what we want, we want our young brothers to do, become what you are. You are a Muslim by nature. Then be yourself and train to be that. These brothers don't carry guns, but they're strong men in their faith in God, not in the gun, but in the God. Imagine what they would be if they had a gun. <laughs> and they take guns from those who present them with guns. I pray that they won't force us to get into that kind of thing. Because, you know, we came from the street, you know. We ain't no saints that fell out of heaven. We're the same as you, brothers. We came right up out of the street, out of jails. We were yesterday's dope pushers, pimps, and hustlers, and killers as well as college students and businessmen and all kind of stuff. And we cleaned up by the help of Allah to become servants of God and servants of our people. And that's what we want to see you, man. You, you, are, you are the strength of our community. You don't want to be the destroyers of your community. You want to be the saviors of your community. Come on and let's help show you how to do that. Thank you for a very wonderful uh, evening. Thank you. I'd like to ask all those who are, are there any here who are here for the first time? I see your hands. Really? First time. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Those of you who are here for your first time, how many of you believe that what you are taught tonight that it is true and good for our people. May I see your hands, please? Thank you. Thank you. Are those of you who say it is true and good to, for our people, how many of you would like to accept this truth and unite with me behind the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and become a part of the nation of Islam and let's build and work to save our people. How many of you would like to do that? May I see your hands? Would you raise them up real high? Really? Isn't that wonderful? Well, may I please, may I please have the privilege before we close tonight of just shaking your hand now, I don't want anybody that didn't raise your hand to come up and shake my hand. I just want those sisters and those brothers who raise your hands that want to unite with me and with us. I would like the brothers to come forward on this side. Sisters, you come forward and I'll come right down here and shake your hand and then Minister Ishmael will have a closing prayer. <laughs>